introduction. Hi, my name is Richard. I'm part of the Google Vizier team. Um, today I'll be talking about open source Vizier, basically the open source version of Google, Google Vizier system. Um, but first of all, I just want to say that this project could not have been possible without the efforts of multiple teams, including the main Vizier team, but also other parts of Brain AutoML and TensorFlow probability. Um, so yeah, to start off, I'd first like to give a brief background of the hyper primer tuning efforts here at Google. Okay. So internally, Google Vizier first launched in 2017, and it has since then optimized and even been the distributed backbone of many of Google's research and product efforts, right? Monthly, it serves thousands of Google employees and has so far tuned millions of, of objectives. And so here are some examples of uh, notable users and downstream wins, right? So for example, one thing is, of course, making money, okay? So for production cases, Google Vizier has been used to turn uh, hyper primer tune search ads and YouTube. Um, and there are many components. Another case is for research, right? We've definitely helped out quite a few teams um, get their papers accepted by hyper primer tuning their pipelines. So this includes hardware design, robotics, and protein design. And also, uh, lastly, not just um, some people don't actually just use Vizier for tuning, but they also use it as infra to control their large compute jobs with their own evolutionary algorithms. So this includes neural architecture search and symbolic algorithm search, right? Or uh, in other, other people call it genetic algorithms um, or sorry, genetic programming. But yeah, so here's a rough rundown of what's happened so far inside Google. Um, so in this talk, basically I'll give, uh, here's an outline of what's gonna happen. So I'm gonna first talk about the system aspect, then I'm gonna talk about the API and then lastly, I'll talk about the research directions from open source to zero. Uh, before that, do we have any questions? And anyone, feel free to uh, you know, interrupt me if, if necessary, if you have a question. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I can go on. So the very first question I always get asked all the time is, why a service? OK, so to understand this, I, I got to give some background on the wide variety of use cases for black box optimization. So normally um, you may use it to tune machine learning models, but there are a lot of other use cases, like for example, you're using it to uh, optimize chemicals or proteins for some fu uh, function. And sometimes even you, you're trying to optimize things like your cookies, right? So actually the Vizier team did this experiment back in 2017, where the goal is to optimize people's taste ratings um, when you're baking cookies, right? So this is actually a human evaluated objective. But basically, one thing's for certain is that these are all different, very different. Uh, these are all very different workflows. And so these different workflows, they can be organized by very different possibilities. Okay. So first of all, uh, your um, evaluation might take seconds to weeks, right? There are a wide variety of cases where you're you're doing something like very very quick, or you're doing it very very slow. Um, another case is the evaluation budget, right? Sometimes you only need you only have time for like ten trials, and sometimes you can even go up to like 10 million trials. Another case is uh, if it's sequential or asynchronous, or if it's synchronous and batched, okay? Um, and other things are like, other things can be like, okay, if you fail in evaluation, what do you do, right? If it's from human error, what do you do? Like, do you call it infeasible? Do you want to retry it? Or do you want to ignore it? There are many different cases for this. And also for machine learning, you might want to care about early stopping too. So the benefits of a service is that it's the best design to try to handle all these possibilities, okay? So in a service, the user has the freedom of requesting trials, evaluating trials, and reporting results, okay? Furthermore, a service can preserve data on prior usage to suggest potential improvements. So here at Google, this actually led to our recent off-former paper, which used the Vizier database over all of the Google's, Googler's um, studies. So to provide the community to this type of service, that's why we released open source of Vizier. And it's a Python version of the Google Vizier service. And ideally a user can host their own service and control all aspects of the tuning pipeline. So uh, I just want to compare uh, the many other packages out there first. So there are three main types of packages. Um, the first one are basically services, which uh, open source of Vizier is part of. So services can host algorithms on a server and are both flexible and scalable, but they may, may require additional engineering complexity, right? Like I have to write my own server and client logic. 
The second are frameworks, which execute the entire optimization loop. So while framework is convenient and allows full automation, it, it also requires knowledge of the user's entire evaluation pipeline and requires everything to be in the same language. And then the last one most common, I think, are libraries, which just implement black box optimization algorithms. So while they offer the most freedom, they lack technical features like resource management, error recovery, therefore they lack scalability, and they're usually limited to the single machine. And again, normally your objective has to be the same programming, programming language as the platform. So examples of services are, of course, our own, very own open source Vizier. Another one is Advisor. So this is actually an external effort to reproduce Google Vizier, and we're not related to that at all, but, but imitation is like the sincerest form of flattery. So, so thank you for that one. And um, Openbox, uh, another one is Openbox back in 2021. So examples of framework, frameworks include Axe and uh, HP Bankster. And lastly, examples of libraries include VOTorch, HyperOp, and Dragonfly. And so here's a comparison between all these different packages. Um, we think that open source of zero provides high flexibility in client languages, allows parallel trial evaluations, and contains multiple features. So in terms of infrastructure, what ha actually happens right underneath all this is that open source of zero's distributed communication are formatted as protocol buffers and sent through this package called gRPC. Basically, uh, protobufs right, are, are used widely throughout Google. And what they do is they allow you to talk, uh, different machines to talk to each other, regardless of the platform. Okay. But rest assured, like the user doesn't actually have to deal with any of these things. We hide all this with PyVizier, a Python library shared across all Vizier services. And basically, ideally, um, we want to make you know development in open source Vizier Pythonic and hopefully less complex, right? So on the left hand side, this is what you'd have to do if you're actually dealing with protos. But on the right hand side, this is what you actually uh, were meant to write using the Python API. But one important benefit, right, of using protobufs is that they support literally any uh, language and platform. So protobufs are ubiquitous across any language basically C++, Python, Java, and uh, many more, and also any platform. So this includes Lin uh, Linux, Windows, and Mac. So therefore, basically, the service can be in a Python Linux machine, but you can be tuning something written in C++ using Windows. And not just that, your algorithm can also be in a separate machine, maybe even written, in a, let's say, Java. Right. So we're not really stuck to using Python at all. It's just the easiest language to work with. Um, so to give a brief rundown of what actually really happens in the um, protocol, so uh, it consists of the following steps. So first, the client sends a suggest trial request in RPC to the server. Then the server starts a Pythia policy to compute the next suggestion. So to keep track of the progress, the server records the details in what's called an operation protobuf. So we do this so that it's fully fault tolerant. Right. If the server ever crashes, it can recover from things like this. Um, that's why we record all these details. Then um, the client will just repeatedly ping the server on the status of this operation and eventually receive the suggestion. Okay. And since, as I said, all transactions and operations are stored in the database, um, you can always log the history. And here's a more animated version of what I just said. Okay. So basically, the client here will send these triangles, these requests basically suggestion request to the service. Yeah, he's doing it now. And then the, uh, the suggest request, right, gets sent to Pythia, basically the algorithm uh, component of our service. And the service will receive the, back these suggestions or squares. And these get logged in the data store. And then the uh, suggestions, these squares are sent, get, get sent back to the clients right now. And then they perform the evaluations and return the measurements or as like uh, animation, animation pentagons. Uh, before I continue, are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. So, <clears throat> so I mean, the whole scheduling of jobs, right, of training jobs, that's that I still have to do, right? So if I if I download VCA, then the only thing you give me is this next next candidate. And so, what are the clients? They need to sort of provision hardware. They need to, you know, they need to do all the business. That's not what you're doing for them, right? Um. So the clients, uh, so the clients, 
Right. You have to set, set up your own, like, uh, you have to set, define your own, whatever it is that you're tuning. Right. The, the client API really just says, okay, um, give me a suggestion from the server. Basically give me some hyperparameter to evaluate, and then you're going to return the evaluation. But other than that, we let you completely do whatever you want with evaluating the objective. Right. So it, I, ideally it's, it's trying to be fully flexible there. Um, as for like scheduling, I, I, I'm not too clear on what you mean by that. Um, well, I'm, I, I just mean that if I want to use this, I still have to do a lot on my end, right? If say I have, I don't know, I want to tune something on uh, eight GPUs uh, using them in parallel. Whenever something is free, I want to schedule something new on them. I have to do all of that. The only thing you, your service gives me that it tells me what to tune, right? It's just well, so, um, so you can actually have multiple clients running the same exact code and then actually underneath the server will handle like the ordering of these clients right so if you let's say you have um eight gpus and one gpu trained one model you can actually use the exact same code um on all these gpus and basically visitor actually handles like the ordering between who gets what suggestion and so mm -hmm. forth so your gpus can be you know like one worker can be delayed in sending back some some um measurements but that's totally fine. Vizier knows how to handle all of this kind of stuff. So the the parallelization, dealing with these kinds of like who is idle, who is on, who is doing something, uh, that's all handled by Vizier internally. Yeah. Okay, but but do you have any sort of, I mean, do you have any suggestion for the other side? Because that's what, you know, that's what most people struggle with, right? I mean, I can I can put up uh, algorithms for next uh, the, ne the next config, but I need I need to basically schedule all of that. I need to you know make sure that I use my hardware efficiently. I need to make sure that I I don't know that I make these different instances talk to each other. And I mean, I know that you guys have all of that at Google, but do you also open source something that that does that for me? Because otherwise. Yeah. It's little... Um, in the next later slides, I'll show you the API, and I, I ho hopefully that will answer your question. I think okay. it, that'll, that'll be most relevant. Yeah. <clears throat> um, any other questions? Okay, cool. So yeah, here's basically the user or client API that's gonna that I'm gonna discuss. So just to give off some brief definitions, right? This is just how we define objects in Vizier. It's not that important. Um, the details really are not that important. Like you just have to know that, you know, a study is an entire optimization run and the study contains multiple objects like search space, algorithm, noise level, uh, parameter specifications, example. And basically um, for our search space, the supported search space contains parameters of type uh, double, which is continuous range, um, integer, which is only like the integers in that range, uh, discrete, which is a finite set of floats, and a categorical, which is a finite set of streams. And also every parameter contains a scaling type like uniform or log. And also every parameter can have a child parameter uh, or multiple child parameters. So this is the useful for cases involving conditional search where for example, let's say you're trying to uh, select between SGD or Atom. Well, Atom has more downstream hyperparameters like momentum, et cetera, than SGD. So this, these uh, parameters like momentum will be child parameters of the uh, atom optimizer, but not of the SUD, right? So these conditional searches, um, you cannot possibly do that. So now um, in terms of setting up the client, I guess this is the most relevant to the question, is that this is what normally, uh, how normally a user sets up a tuning using the client API. So what ends up happening is you first define the algorithm and the search space. Um, and you can uh, define additional metrics, things like that. But once you do that, you send in this, this what's called a study config into this function called like from study config. And what it will do is create this client. We, we just shorthand it, shorthand named it as a study. But basically this thing has a client wrapped inside of it, which can talk to a server. And note that you can do this over multiple different workers. So you're gonna, you can actually, um, write this exact same code over different multiple workers, which means you can launch this in parallel. And so now all of them will, will be um, basically contains a client 
to be talking to the same uh, same server. And so um, uh, there are two different use cases uh, when it comes to the server. So the first one is if you only care about running things locally, like you only care about running one client, that's the majority of uh, use cases, then the server will be implicitly created for you, uh, you know, in localhost 6006 or something. But in the distributed case, you can actually set up the server yourself. So basically, um, it, uh, on a server machine, you would de then call this, right? Then it just live forever, ideally. And then you let all of your clients um, talk to this by just giving the address of the server machine. And so in the tuning loop, um, what happens is that uh, every client will attain some suggestions from the server and the client will evaluate the suggestions. And then once you get your metrics for that, the client right, will complete the suggestions and update the server with these metrics, right? So this for loop, you can run on every single worker and the, the, the Vizier server will handle like the scheduling between who's getting what suggestion and, and in what order. So I hope that answers the question about like the, the scheduling part, right? Like it's up to you to define what this evaluation evaluate function is, right? Because because we're to give you the most flexibility, but otherwise all the other quote unquote scheduling components are handled by the server itself. You just have to set up this client um, and that's it. I think, I think uh, the question here was, um, so who starts the, this Python script? So who spawns the, the Python process that runs this for loop? Is that Vizier or is that? Oh, this is, this is the user. This is the user. Okay. So if I want to run like, let's say four clients, then I have to uh, call four times this Python script that runs this evaluation with this for loop here, right? Yeah, you can, you, yeah, this for loop, you can wrap it in like, there are multiple different types of parallelizations, right? You can have this for loop be run on like four different threads or four different processes, or you literally can have four different machines, separate machines running the exact same loop and it'll be the same functionality. They will all be talking to the same server, server handles the parallelization. Yeah. And the server, the, so the server runs then basically a database and all of this data is, is um, written into the database. That's correct. Uh, Yes. So the server, the server handles a lot of different things. So yes, one thing that handles is like the request and how, how uh, the server handles like what, what it's going to store from these requests. And the server is going to also handle like the, like, you know, uh, the locking procedures and things like that so that these requests are all parallelized properly. Um, yeah, the server also handles like the algorithm like component two but you can actually separate that out from the server, uh, from the service. But basically normally what happens is um, the service handles all these requests and creates the necessary uh, Pythia policies or algorithms to compute these suggestions. Yeah, maybe one, one little bit. Uh, so <clears throat> some algorithms, they allow you to take clients and band them together. So say they do a distributed training, right? So they share the gradient computations. Can, can you support that as well? I mean, in this case, I, I see how it works, right? You, you have this client and it just sits there and says, hey, I can do something, what should I do? And it does something and then it asks again. But, but do you also support that clients can be clumped together to do part of the time something together? Or? Um, that feature, like that feature, probably not because we have a strict separation of like, like what a notion of a client is like the client is basically just there to take in a suggestion and evaluate it and report back the measurements. But yes, the user like deals with, yeah, like that's sort of the, our, our definition of a client it, yeah. It's just one unit, unit of work. That, that performs the evaluation once, you could say, something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, but at the same time, the next slides I'll talk about, like, how do we make the algorithms um, deal with these kinds of parallel situations? Because normally everybody writes sequential algorithms, but that's, you can't do that in a service. Um, yeah, but I yeah. I have a quick so, question, if I, if I may. Um, can you talk more about the data store or how does the server write 
what what data store does it use? And and yeah. if, if I'm a random person on GitHub and I want to use Azure, what data store does it work with? So the default right now is a SQL Alchemy. So everything right now is in SQL. What happens in under the hood is that um, like these proto buffs, these so basically right everything is under this in the in the service is stored as a proto buff, right? And proto buffs are serializable. Therefore, I can convert them into something that SQL can accept. And so the data store itself currently, the what we support is a SQL Alchemy, which is like this Python wrapper around just regular SQL. Um, but we have like these classes are are very modularized, modularized, which means that if you implement like the base abstract class for a data store, then you can also use your own data store if necessary. Um, but as like for for convenience for the user, we use uh, a SQL based data store. So inside at Google, it's roughly the same thing. Like we have our own propri proprietary SQL variant that supports protobufs much better, but it's 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 essentially the same thing. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Um. Yeah. If there are no, let me go go through here. Yeah. If there are no more questions for now, I can talk about the algorithms then. Um, so yeah, so what you just saw is the user API. But then let's say you're a researcher uh, or, or anybody who wants to modify the algorithms too. So let me talk about that too. So normally, right, this is your very typical algorithm design, right? Like this is a very standard API uh, that almost everybody would probably use in some way, right? Algorithms normally just need right an update function to collect what the results previously were, and a suggest function which suggests the next um, proposes the next suggestions. But this is too simple to be uh, put in a service because in a service uh, you have to make these sort of things fault tolerant and recover from failures when needed. Okay, but also you, not just that you have to handle things like um, like what is act like like how many active trials have I outputted recently or like what is the current state of who, who's doing what etc so um yeah so one thing at least that you definitely need is fault tolerance because if the service goes offline if it breaks if it if it burns down or something you still need to be able to recover from that and that's part of the reason that we have a data store and um that's one hard requirement so one thing that you can do in terms of the algorithm recovery is that you can think of the historical trials you've seen so far as effectively the algorithm state, right? Um, right. The history of all the things you've seen so far, you can try to recover your algorithm from that history. And so therefore, um, one thing in the service that we require is that um, your algorithms need to be able to query the history to collect whatever trials you need to to recompute re your like current algorithm state, right? This is important for algorithms which also work in let's say batches of populations like uh, evolutionary algorithms, right? Because you need to recover the population. So while I showed you the API for what's called the designer, here's the API that what, what gets actually used in the service. So this is the policy API for hosting algorithms. So what happens is that this policy normally has this thing called a policy supporter, which you use to query trials uh, previous trials to try to recover your state and um in this code basically what you see in the suggest function is like a typical example right you use the policy supporter to get the trials both the completed and the current active trials and you send it through a stateless algorithm implementation to try to get the next suggestions um right this is now fault tolerant because if this thing breaks it's fine you can still recover all the uh, trials back from the data store and send it through again through the stateless algorithm logic. You can also wrap a designer around this by basically saying, okay, update the designer, like create a fresh designer, update the designer with all the previous completed trials and compute the next suggestions as well. Right, so this is a, basically a typical pipeline that we use. Basically like it's your, your logic for the algorithm is usually stateless or you know, a designer and we have some special ones too to deal with like serialization of states. You don't have to, you don't necessarily have to like get all the trials back in. 
Um, but but this is the importance of having uh, the policy API as well. And so uh, the algorithms that are supported include uh, classic ones like random search and grid search, uh, evolutionary ones like CMAES and NSGA2, uh, more esoteric ones like box and harmonica only support um, Boolean search spaces. These are more research-based. And then uh, the last one I, I do want to talk about is the default algorithm, which is uh, the Bayesian optimization one, the GP bandit. Um, yeah. Before that, actually, is, are there any questions about the API for, for algorithms? Okay. So I, in in I general, I'm, I was just wondering, are you also supporting <clears throat> not, not just trials, but how far they went, right? How many epochs they trained or so? That, is this part of what you call trial or? Yeah, so in a, in a trial, it can, it can contain, in a, uh, sorry, I, I, I may, might need to like separate out suggestion and trial, but they're roughly the same thing. But trial just means like something that has some measurements. Basically, there are like partially finished trials that, that can contain like intermediate measurements, right? Like the like yeah. the accuracy over time. But the but that trial is still not considered completed. It's still just active. And mm -hmm. uh, you can use these uh, sort of trials for early stopping, things like that. So you can that's that's why the policy <clears throat> like the policy API is here is so that you can look at your previous trials, not just completed, but also the active ones and then figure out, okay, do I want to do some early stopping or something like that? I, yeah. I didn't show the early stopping API, but it exists. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks. And I have a follow up. Um, yeah. Can you explain the intuition behind like policy? Like, why is it? Why is this called policy? How, how, like policy supporter? Can you, can you elaborate on the intuition by naming this policy? Like, what does this do exactly? Yeah. So um, let me give you more of a historical context. So when when Google Visitor was written, uh, like the service is hosted a bunch of CPU workers and these CPU workers can be preempted at any time. So under this condition, it basically means that if you don't properly wrap your algorithms, then they can just automatically die whenever, right? And someone's like entire work can be like destroyed. So, so the solution for this, the simple solution for this one is basically being able to uh, once a worker restarts, once a service worker restarts, uh, it and a user wants to use it again. So it looks at the pre to to, to resume tuning. It looks at the previous set of trials that are completed, and then you have to recover the algorithm logic again. Okay. So originally we had a like that's the basis for the policy. That's why we have this abstraction. Like you like. This policy, you're gonna always assume that it, it die, it can die at any time. So that's why the the API for the suggest is written like this. Because like if you assume that it can die at any time, then then you have to have this logic of like, okay, I'm gonna recover all the previous data from the history, or maybe some parts of it selectively, and then load it back into an, some algorithm implementation um, to be able to resume my tuning. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so like the, the general p policy is just to do this. It isn't that there are multiple policies you can choose from, but the, the policy is to load, like load and then keep going. Load Loading. and keep going. Yeah, like, um, so we have wrappers that that uh, go from, you know, this designer, right? Most people should be writing the algorithms in the designer API and just wrapping it around uh, into a policy. However, in certain cases, if you don't like this API for whatever reason, like it might not support whatever you want, then someone can actually implement their own policy itself. It's just that uh, the caveat there is like, you have to deal with the distributed logic yourself. Like you have to have this kind of writing logic. You have to deal with the fact that you, this policy might die at any time. So you have to write your logic around that. Got it, got it, got it. So, so you can write multiple policies. There are some defaults. And if you write a new policy, make sure it follows general flow needed. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Now, let me just talk about briefly like the default algorithm. Um, so basically, uh, I just want to give a historical context. So 
Vizier was released before auto differentiation even existed. This basically means that like there were no, you know, tensorflow probability like Gaussian processes to speed up whatever. You had to write everything in C++ to make it very fast, right? So basically this is why currently the algorithm is inside Google is written in C++, but we are now trying to switch in Python and this is one of the efforts, okay? So the algorithm itself in the open source version is a Python plus JAX version, okay? So, and it, it, it roughly matches the C++ algorithm implementation. We took like months to, to make sure that that's true um, because there are actually multiple details. And let me enumerate some of these details. So one of them is the, of course, the Gaussian process kernel. Uh, we use the maternity five halves for that one. It's not a big deal. Another one is like the acquisition function. We use the UCB or upper confidence bound. Uh, but one thing to note here is that unlike other packages which might um, optimize the acquisition function using like gradient descent, uh, I think BioTorch does this a lot. We use uh, an evolutionary optimizer. We call things like something like Eagle strategy to optimize the acquisition function. Um, yeah, there are other things to make sure this works as smoothly as pro uh, smoothly. So for example, there's objective warping, right? Uh, maybe you, when you're looking at the objectives that you got previously, you might want to remove certain outliers because this might affect the GP, or you might want to fit it to some distribution and, and you might warp it with some log function just to make sure everything's well behaved because you don't want to send dirty stuff to a GP sometimes. Um, right. And also automatic relevance determination. That's also pretty important, right? You're trying to optimize the length scales for all the, uh, parameters. So we use a JAX based uh, LBFGSB optimizer. Uh, originally in C++, it's a, it's, it was a slightly different optimizer, but since now we're using JAX, we're using these other tools and it works just as fine. And so advantages over I, other... I yeah. yeah. Um, so for these design choices, um, uh, if you can, um, could you provide some more detail why you went for them, especially like the acquisition function? I think they're like EI is more popular and also I guess the, the choice of the evolutionary algorithm here for maximizing it is probably not that common. Yeah, good question. So, um, so th I, I think this is one thing that's like they're coupled in a sense. So uh, EI tends to be like sharper in terms of a loss landscape, or at least I think so. Uh, whereas like UCB might be like slightly more smooth. Uh, so like when you look at the types of loss landscapes for those acquisition functions, therefore that couples with, okay, how do I optimize them properly, right? Because for instance, I think like gradient descent is good for certain loss landscapes. Whereas evolution algorithms and like zero order optimization is good for other landscapes. So it turns out that uh, for some reason, like after having tuned everything over, over the past years or so, like it turns out this evolutionary optimizer was the best one for optimizing this acquisition function. Now, we certainly don't want to say that this is the best choice, but we found like over, you know, just spanning years and years of this, um, like, and trying to, gradually improve the performance, this seems to be the best uh, uh, for this, this type of algorithm. Note that later on, I'll be talking about introducing other algorithms too, uh, because this is not like the only algorithm supported in the zero, not the only phase optimization. Algorithm. But I hope that semi answers the question. Like, for example, the evolution optimizer previously was like, um, like, like we call it like a linear combination search is something like take the interpolation between two random points or whatever as new, as new point. Um, but apparently this evolution algorithm improved over time. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. So it's a, it's a bunch of reasons, right? Like, like the coupling of acquisition and optimization, but also the fact that this was, everything was based in C++. So it wasn't the case that you could actually even use uh, gradients. So this also affected design choices. Uh, um, thanks for the answer. I have one follow up and um, yeah, uh, I know I'm not sure whether you can um, actually share that information, but um, when evaluating this, would you use customer data or you would rely on public benchmarks? Uh, good question. So um, uh, let me go to the next slide first because um, Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So 
there are certain advantages to uh, over other Bayesian optimization algorithms, right? So one thing is that uh, we really teamed up with like JAX and Tensor, uh, Tensor Pro probability teams. Um, by the way, technically Tensor Pro probability should be called Tensor Friendly probability because they now support JAX only. So it's not just TensorFlow, just to be clear. But but because everything is written in JAX, that means that it supports auto differentiation and GPU uh, speed ups, right? So this is one big advantage because a lot of other packages, with the exception of DeoTorch right, and PyTorch, literally every other package I saw, right, was only supporting NumPy and sklearn. That can be very slow, right, uh, and and doesn't support GPU. Like you can't use it. To, you can't use GPUs to, to to speed those things up. And there are advanced tricks like trust region uh, warping. As I said, warping ARD optimization itself too. So yeah, uh, on the question about the um, how do we optimize our pipeline? So originally we used um, we actually tuned the algorithm itself. So we actually hyper primer optimized the hyper primer optimizer um, over bench public benchmarks such as BBOB functions. We do agree that this might be different from um, like classic right what the actual users really do and so that's why we've been trying to improve on this by um you know providing survey benchmarks or like you know having better benchmarks like like tuning cfr 10 like deep learning models or something like that um but yes this is one un un unanswered question so far um uh that like we've been trying to make progress on i think um one of our previous work that's more on the research side is the off former which did train on the Vizier data set. And, and we have benchmarks over surrogate models over the Vizier data set, the real world data set. So that also may be an option too. Um, yeah. And then the last, last uh, benefit, right, is that we're, we're Google and uh, I guess we have pretty strict code quality concerns. So that means that our code is very rigorously pie typed. It has multiple tests. And we hope that it has very clean abstractions. Um, if if anybody has more questions about this, okay. If not, it's fine. Um, yeah. So next part is basically the integrations, right? So we we don't want just want Vizier to be like this island that that like is not integrated with anything. We definitely want it to be integrated with many of Google's products. And even out the external research community. So one thing, uh, one of one thing for researchers is that we have a benchmarking system, right? Uh, that's like the APIs are are properly you know combined with each other. So basically, uh, included in this benchmarking system, right, are things like BBOB functions, right, synthetic benchmarks, and other you know maybe combinatorial benchmarks. Another one is a NAS bench 101, 201, um, for your like you know for NAS users. Uh, other ones, like I think I've seen our HPLB, right? A surrogate benchmark from real world data. Uh, for people working in auto RL, we also have things like Atari 100K. You can train Atari agents very quickly. Uh, and of course, certain utilities to, to help with this. Another very important integration we have is with PyGlove. So PyGlove is this, uh, yeah. So PyGlove is another core brain AutoML package under Quark Lace Group, and it's written by Dai Peng. So this one is a huge driver behind combinatorial and evolutionary optimization and right? behind a lot of like NAS efforts and genetic programming, things like that. Because one thing is that Vizier natively only supports flat search spaces and at best conditionals, but it doesn't have things like uh, the choice function. You can't just do n choose k kind of search spaces, but, but PyGlove does have these things very easily. And so what we can do is we can integrate the Vizier's backend with PyGlove. This means that Vizier will be only handling the distributed system, but it, we're still going to be using PyGlobe algorithms. And this is why the client API is so important is because you can now even have PyGlobe as like the algorithm backend to, to, to handle the algorithms, but you can still tune your regular like client, like multiple GPU jobs with evolution algorithms, right? So this, right, PyGlobe was very instrumental in doing things related to like, you know, NAS efforts, and so you can reproduce things like, uh, you know, regularized evolution or uh, AutoML zero, uh, ideally, maybe in Python. Um, yeah, the last one, the last major integration I want to talk about is with Google Cloud. 
So this is actually the third of a zero where um, external users or businesses can actually use the same service to tune their objectives professionally. Okay. And since the, all client APIs are the same, someone who's using open source of Azure can actually immediately change the cloud if they want. But this is more geared to like businesses and not just researchers, right? You, you have to pay for the service, but it's right. So it's more, mostly about like maximizing your profit or something for, for like for different businesses. Uh, yeah. As for future, uh, we want to also integrate with the external community. So for example, maybe a potential add on to Raytune, like especially our default algorithm, because uh, I saw their algorithm list, it doesn't contain anything related to like JAX or terms of low probability. And I, I guess we are the best representative of that, of that uh, uh, niche, niche class of uh, methods. Um, another one we're also already doing is uh, we're doing some cross-study integration with OpenML so that OpenML studies can now be used in, like can now be stored in Vizier for, for different use cases uh, for certain projects that I, I, shouldn't go, I should not go into. As for future algorithms too, uh, there is an upcoming UCB uh, PE algorithm, uh, PE stands for pure exploration. Um, that's also upcoming. Uh, so that's a sec that's a second one that can be you can consider as like an official default. Um, uh, there are also baseline reimplementations like Hebo, Turbo, etc. So over time, our algorithm list will be more and more expanded um, to contain all these like previous literature, uh, and we hope they're high quality. And also to actually like you know have a proper um, you know, white paper on these. We'll, we'll be releasing a uh, paper to try to exactly describe what we're doing in these, each of the, these um, default algorithms, and also compare the existing packages to, to verify, right? Uh, you know, how well are we doing to other against other packages? We hope that ours, you know, of course, may be like very good or you know, soda, but we can't claim that right now. Um, but but just just a thought. Um, and then here are the links to everything related to the open source of Azure, right? So these are code. We have a documentation page. Uh, we have a blog post, paper, open review if you want to see the reviews. Um, uh, yeah, but that's the end of my talk.